Can we get right into the man, the myth, the legend that you are? I want to make sure. Rip. I want people to know the real you. I want people to know uh, not just the moments that you had with Tasha, but who you are before you went on the show, right? We know a little bit about your past. We know what you do now. We know that you're uh, recovered uh, from things that have done in the past. Can you, can we just start there? Yeah, 100%. And I appreciate that. I feel like I come on a lot of these and uh, I get a lot of softballs, but no one wants to get beyond that. You know, so I appreciate you saying you really want to get to know me because it's important. Right. And uh, I've kind of lived two lives. You know, I grew up I grew up right outside of Philly um, in South Jersey. And I would tell you that, you know, I was one of five kids and I have parents that are still married today and I never wanted for nothing. You know, like I had a beautiful upbringing. Um, but I, I had a sheltered upbringing, right? In the sense that I grew up in this little like waspy town and, uh, you know, got a great education and, you know, played sports and, and but like was sheltered, you know, and, and, and kind of like lived in this bubble. Um, <clears throat> and in high school, I will say that it was like this days to confuse experience, right? Like we, we'd go out and we'd play some sports and then on the weekends we'd, you know, get the 12 pack of Natty Light and the, the flask of Captain Morgan and go out in the woods and belt out classic rock songs and chase. You want, so you want some uh, of your homies? Yeah, yeah. Sure, I get it, I get it. How sheltered were you? Can you like, like was it bedtime at like 8 p.m. in middle school? Like explain what shelter was in your, in your household. Uh, if I'm being straightforward, um, you know, there was no people of color, there's no black people in my high school, you know, like there was no Jewish people. It was very much like the definition of a waspy town, you know, white Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. Protestant. I mean, that's what it was. So for me, I knew that I was always like missing something like culturally, I knew that I was always missing something in the world. And it was t to the fault of no one um, other than maybe like, if I look back on my experience, maybe my teachers or, or, or even like parents might be could have done a better job of saying like it's a big world out there but mm. i grew up in a way where like you go to this high school you go away for college you come back to this town you raise your family there and you ride off in the sunset like that was my you know vision, vision. yeah cookie cutter yeah and yeah. thank god that i like i took the path i did which was you know partied my ass off in high school, partied my ass off in college. And, you know, that continued into my early and mid twenties to the point where like, you know, 27 years old, uh, I'm running around, you know, uh, Camden, New Jersey, like in the middle of the street life, you know, smoking mm -hmm. crack, shooting dope, like doing the whole thing. Right. So like, I want to know, like, when you were in it, like, did you ever feel like you were in danger with the drugs and everything that you were doing? Like, what was the worst, what were some of the worst things that you experienced when you were addicted? Yeah. I mean, it, it got dark. I definitely have some stories. Um, I knew I was in trouble. I, I, you know, I'm a diehard Philly sports fan and I had gone to an Eagles game on a Sunday my wife, I had been married. My wife at the time, who was kind of like hanging on by a thread, was a school teacher. And I woke up on a Monday morning. At this point, I was hooked on hooked on the junk. And uh, she went to school and I woke up and I, I was dehydrated, but I also knew that I was out of drugs, like I was out of opiates. And for those of you out there listening that have, you know, let's just put it this way. I wouldn't wish a detox from opiates on my worst enemy, right? It's just the worst feeling in the world. So I woke up and I had no money and I was like, I got to, I got a cop. How am I going to cop? And you guys will like this one. So I call my homie, you got that mic. I call my homie and I say, dude, you got to take me to the hospital. I think something's going on. I make it up. He takes me to the hospital. I walk into the hospital. I, I complain about this pain in my side. They take me back. I research gallbladder. I tell the doctor my gallbladder hurts. He proceeds to give me the painkillers that I'm searching for. And I can, from that, I, I went through with the surgery. So I went forward. I got my gallbladder removed. Voluntarily. Voluntarily just to get oh. high for a couple more days. You know, so that's the, like, that's, that's the kind of moment you look back on and be like, man, that, you know, and not to mention the, the, the dozens of time, and I'm not proud of it, that I drank and drove, right? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. you know, the blackouts and the debauchery and 
all that stuff. I'll never forget. I was, I was, uh, it was 2007. So it was a year after I got out of college. And at this point in my life, I'm partying hard, you know, Thursday through Sunday, kind of drinking, blacking out, doing Coke, whatever it is, hanging out with the boys, chasing girls. And, um, you know, I, uh, I had my car packed to go down the Jersey shore for the weekend, which is like, you know, it's a, whatever in Jersey, it's an hour away. Everyone, you know, Memorial day, you go party. And I had, I had this feeling of this, uh, of like days come over me and I wasn't feeling good for like a week leading up to that. And I told my family and they, none of them took me seriously. Cause at this point I'm drinking so much, like you're just hung over, you're just hung over. And I, uh, I went out to a club in Philly that night and I fell over and the bouncer like picked me up and threw me out of the, of the bar. And the next morning I said, I got to go see, to like an x-ray place. Something's going on. And the lady comes back in the room and she's like, sir, you can't move. Right. Like, and at this point I'm like 24 years old and they found a huge growth on my brain. Wow. And within 24 hours, I'm in the hospital down at UPenn getting this brain tumor cut out of my head. Right. And so what was going through your mind at that point? Well, like, well that's, that, that's the point here. This geez. is the craziest shit about, about addiction and alcoholism and like the obsession, which is like to a normal person lying in that hospital bed. I was never alone. There was so much love. People bringing me cheesesteaks, soft pretzels. I'm watching the Phillies game. Like I should have been like a pig and shit. Like I should have been the happiest guy in the world. <laughs> I lived, you know, I lived like it was, it was supposed to be this like heroic moment for Zach. And lying there, I kid you not, for 25 days, learning how to walk, talk, eat, you know, the whole thing, occupational therapy. All I could think about was getting out of that hospital bed and going back to drinking and drugging the way that I wanted to. And now, oh, wow. and now I knew that I kind of had this like sob story, you know, or like this, this, this kind of like shield that no one could tell me what to do. And so I saw it as like this badge of honor to go do whatever the hell I wanted. And and that's when I was really introduced to the opiates. And from there, like, it was like, what are the kids saying today? Like to the moon, like I just took off and it was no looking back. 